That was pretty good, especially at an FCA event. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, wonderful kickoff to the celebration of Lincoln Park tonight. There's uh, so many people to thank, and we'll continue to do that throughout the evening. But uh, uh, especially all of you for coming, being here on such a beautiful evening. Um, I'm sure it's tempting to be outside playing out there, but it's also great to celebrate Parks Inside tonight, too, so thank you. I'm David Haggerty. I'm the president of the Fauntleroy Community Association, and this is my first uh, official duty of the Fauntleroy Community Association. So, so give me a break. Um, you, you may like my, my uniform here. These are brand new, uh, part of the um, evening's festivities, but also now part of Fulmeray Community Association garb, so when we're at different events, um, you will be able to easily spot us. So Turn it's around and show me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Wine bottles will fit in there. So. so we've got some great community tables here tonight. I um, want to thank them all for coming and point them out here. Let me grab my notes. We've got the Whale Trail with Donna and Donna Show over here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Seattle Parks and Recreation is back there with that beautiful We've <laughs> got Superintendent Christopher Williams, uh, uh, Dan Johnson, and then uh, Robert Sowers. And Robert is our, Robert, where are you? Thank you, there you are, sir. He is our liaison for the Fauntleroy Community Association, as well as liaison for the for Lincoln Park in our, in our area with, with parks, so thank you. Um, <coughs> animal control was not able to be here this evening. They had an emergency, they didn't have enough staff, something like that, but they wanted to say, if you have anything to say to them at all, please give them a call at 206-386-4286. So that's how important it is that they wanted us to shout out their number here tonight. Uh, seal sitters, Larry Carpenter, where are you? Thank you, Larry. And Lisa McGinty from Friends of Lincoln Park. And Alliance uh, for Lincoln Park, Cass is back there. Their Cass is sitting down, probably right there. <laughs> Green Seattle Partnership, Mark Mead. Where are you, Mark? Thank you. <laughs> and Steve, uh, uh, Steve Rain with Steve Richmond. I was going to say both those things together. So where are you? There you go. And uh, Fauntleroy YMCA, Stacy, right back there. And I'm going to say that. Bobby L. So, um, tonight we've got some great speakers. Our first one is Judy Pickens. She's going to talk a little bit about history of Lincoln Park. So. Thank you. I appreciate the assignment because it was a good reason to delve a little more specifically into the history of our major park. <laughs> it is, uh, the request was for seven minutes. So, you're going to get history in a nutshell. <laughs> Lincoln Park has been Lincoln Park for 91 years, longer than nearly all of us have been alive. With such a long history, as you can imagine, the presen this presentation is going to hit the high points. And you can find more details if you care to search starting with the Seattle Parks website. Prior to European settlers, Fondleroy Cove was a seasonal camp for Coast Salish people. With sentries posted at Brazen Point and Point Williams, they could safely harvest food and other supplies from the water and upland forests. Somewhat washed out uh, on the screen, but timber companies heavily logged the area that became Fauntleroy. That may be familiar history to you all. And then they sold it in large plants that um, people sat on until we had roads and finally the streetcar. And that's what made the Fauntleroy neighborhood take off. This 1912 map shows three owners of what would become Lincoln Park. We have 
So when they upper in the upper segment, um, the same upper in the middle segment, and lo and behold, another upper in the lower segment, and then someone else owning um, the point area. Some of you will recognize in the lower right the Fauntleroy Land Company as belonging to pioneers John and Maggie Adams. His real estate business is the one that sold many of the home sites where we live today. In 1922, the city purchased 107 acres of land and 23 acres of tidelands for a new major park, paying just over $104,000. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that would be roughly $1.4 million in today's dollars. Still a huge bargain. The Olmsted brothers recommended the purchase, but the firm did not develop plans for this park. Now, Lincoln proved to be a very portable name. Lincoln Reservoir on Capitol Hill had the name from 1901 to 1922, when it became the Broadway Playfield and then the Bobby Morris Playfield, and the entire site is now known as Cal Anderson Park. So that had the name Lincoln first. Lincoln Beach at 48th and Beach Drive had the name at roughly the same time, 1909 to 25, when it was changed to Lowman Beach Park. The present site was first known as Fauntleroy Park, then was changed to Lincoln when the park board wanted to honor the 16th president with a statue in a major park. The park got the name, but never the statue. <laughs> <laughs> the first shelter, now known as shelter number three, the one on the beach with the large fireplace, was built in 1925 and christened with band concerts. I confirmed the location with Maurice Garrett yesterday, who is now 99, and his father worked on the first shelter, and Maurice still claims that his father's initials are in the mortar of Fireflies. <laughs> A city building fund and local improvement district then generated money for further development, including what we now know as the North Parking Lot in 1928 and the Tide Fed Swimming Pool in 1929. What interested me was the existence then of local improvement districts, which we still have. The South Seawall and other major infrastructure projects were accomplished during the Great Depression through the Federal Civil Works Administration and later the Works Progress Administration. Maury's father worked for both. They um, worked on the seawall in the upper right photo and various um, clearing and planting projects in the lower left and then such infrastructure as the grand staircases down from the street level. <coughs> now some features came and then they went. You won't see this lily pond or this waterfall in the park today, but the images are preserved thanks to Edward Kilborn, who took many photographs of the park and also many, many photographs of children using the park and the beach. <laughs> Now, 
getting a little closer to when some of your memories may kick in. The present Coleman Pool opened in 1941 when even some young women dared to wear bikinis. <laughs> it was built using $153,000 donated by the Coleman family in memory of Lawrence Coleman. In 2013 dollars, that gift would amount today to nearly $2.4 million. So, one could build quite a pool for $2.4 million today. The pool was totally refurbished last year at a cost of roughly $1.4 million. <laughs> Lincoln Park soon became the site for many community activities, including at the upper left storytelling on Girls' Day in 1941, and in the middle, foot races at the West Seattle Commercial Club's annual picnic in 1949. Today, of course, it's a popular park for dog walking, beach exploration, fishing, and even Shakespeare. Similar to Interstate 90, Lincoln Park has seldom been without a construction project. <laughs> Storms have pounded the south seawall and promenade, necessitating patches and then fixes. A wastewater line had to be built along the shoreline, then repaired a few years ago when it broke. And you may have been here, here when barges offloaded tons of rock and gravel with community notice and without to re-nourish the South Beach. History is, of course, a story, and it's still being written. By pulling ivy and planting salal, tracking and protecting park wildlife, or crying foul when officials need to hear it, you are helping write the next chapter in the story of Lincoln Park. Thank you, Judy. It's true, it is, it is uh, history is part of the story, and we're going to continue with that story tonight with some other wonderful folks. Um, Friends of Lincoln Park, I think it's been around for eight years. Is that what we were just talking about, Sharon? It's about 05. 05, so. Um, and um, Sharon's going to come up to us uh, and talk with us about the ecology of Lincoln Park and also the uh, appreciation that we have of having a big, beautiful open space like this in our city. So, wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Lisa McGinty and I are the volunteer for stewards in Lincoln Park. Um, how many of you have spent time in Lincoln? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> how many of you volunteered with Friends of Lincoln Park? <laughs> how many of you would like to in the future? <laughs> we welcome you. Yeah. And um, for those who aren't able to sign on and volunteer with us, we also have some suggestions for things you can do when you're walking in the park. And I'll talk about that on Saturday when I lead a walk in the park invasives that you can pull when you're walking in the park. Um, Friends of Lincoln Park is a fairly informal organization. Can people see? Am I in your way? I'm going to see one. Yeah. Um, and, but we're part of a, a much larger project. Um, we're part of the Green Seattle Partnership. The Green Seattle Partnership was started in 2004. It's an agreement between the city and what was then Cascade Land Conservancy and is now uh, Fortura. And it's a one-time, 20-year project to restore our urban forests. There are basically two primary goals involved. One is to bring 2,500 acres of urban forest in Seattle under restoration. Now this says restore, um, but now we say under restoration because it's never finished. You always have to go back and do maintenance, especially in the city and then to establish means to be able to maintain the 
good work that's been done in the park. <coughs> what would happen if we didn't restore Lincoln Park? This is a Green Seattle Partnership uh, graphic that I think uh, gives you the picture. Um, invasive, invasive plants destroy the natives and prevent regeneration of new natives. And if we didn't do the restoration, in 100 years we have blackberries, ivy, holly, laurel, clematis, rats, that would be it. With our efforts, though, we hope to end up with a healthy, beautiful forest. And Lincoln Park is more than just a beautiful place to be. It also provides major ecosystem services for our community. There's a handout over on the table that has all of these details. So don't, don't try to write all those things. Some of the things that, that uh, Urban Forest does is to reduce stormwater runoff, improve water quality, reduce erosion, increase property values, improve air quality, make communities more attractive, reduce global warming, um, provide wildlife habitat and buffer noise. There are also benefits for individuals. Um, Kath Kathleen Wolf at the University of Washington, along with her colleagues and students, have put together a website, and that handout has the website on it, which um, talks about the increasing amounts of research that are being done that support the idea that contact with nature is beneficial to humans in many ways. Can help cognitive fatigue recovery, improve ad workers' attitudes and well-being, lower blood pressure, heart rate, reduce violence in families, and reduce violence and aggression among kids in schools. But there are, um, about in August of last year, the, there was a report released looking at urban forests in Seattle. And um, here's a, the executive summary that's also on the handout. There are about over 4 million trees in Seattle. That's about 80 trees per acre. The most common trees are red alder, uh, big leaf maple, and uh, big hazelnut, all of which are native trees. Um, and the replacement value of our urban forests in Seattle are about $5 billion. So that's about $1,000 a tree, over 1000 One of the things that the report really emphasized is the ecosystem values of the forest. Our urban forests um, store and sequester about $12 million worth of carbon. They remove about $5.6 million worth of pollution from the air. And they also save about $6 million in energy. So Lincoln Forest is, Lincoln Park is a hardworking forest. All of our forests are. And it isn't just the um, urban forests in the parks and national areas account for about 20% of the canopy cover. The other 80% is in your yards and on your parking strips and in commercial sites. So it's vitally important that we pay attention to invasive plants and to maintaining canopy in, in those areas as well. Um, Steve can tell you about that. He's been doing a lot of work, been doing a lot of thinking in that area. The report also detailed a couple of threats to our urban forest. One is pest species. Here's an example of the, of the Asian longhorn beetle. It hasn't been found here yet, to my knowledge, but if it were to invade, it could cause some pretty serious problems for our forests. The other threat that the report uh, delineates is invasive plants. So we're coming from a full circle here. Friends of Lincoln Park is a volunteer group that's working to remove invasives and plant natives to reduce the threats to our urban forest. Um, you may, do you, does anybody recognize that hillside? That's on, on 48th, um, just up from Loman Beach. It's like a poster child for invasive plants, that corridor through there. You know, there's ivy, blackberries, clematis, holly, laurel, everything. But there's also hope in there. Can you see the white in the middle? That's trillium. That's a beautiful 
data plan. Our forests are not dead, but they really do need help at this point. Um, and the thing I like about doing this forest restoration work is that it's, it's solid, it's real, it's something that you can do to make a difference, both for your community and for your globe. So, it's a great series of photos taken by Judy Lane. I think Judy is here somewhere. Yeah, there she is. Um, who is a photographer and artist in West Seattle. And these are our, our resident uh, eagles in the park in, here last summer. And uh, Judy recorded this conversation between mom and dad and Ethan. And, and the suspicion is that they're arguing about who's responsible for dinner for the, <laughs> for the young one in the nest. Um, Lincoln Park connects us with the web of life. <clears throat> and Lincoln Park is also our legacy to future generations. Um, and this powerful young man is Lisa's son, Finn. <laughs> And Finn is just pulling out his first invasive shrub. <laughs> and uh, his comment after he finished it was, that was fun. <laughs> and that's what we were discovering doing our restoration work. Not only is it something that's really worth doing, um, but it really is fun too. Even if you don't see him. 
Um, I, I, this is a terrible picture, but it's such a tender scene. I just, I just loved it. And here's mom or dad cleaning his toenails. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 there's a couple of the upcoming pictures that are a little fuzzy, but it's, it's worth it for the story they tell. So one day, we have friends from out of town, and we're walking along, and there's a baby owl, and he falls, and we're like, oh, no. <laughs> and he just bounces up. And he starts um, wandering over. He doesn't wander. He looks around like, oh, now what? And there's a little tiny, can you see him over here? You saw, yeah. You see him? Yeah, there he is, if you can't see him. Little tiny buckball down there. And of course, the risk here is uh, fish dogs going after him. And so it's good that we have people who know the stories who can watch out. So what he does is he trundles across the forest and he finds another tree. He stops and looks up at one tree and he stops and looks up at the next tree. And then he picks one and he starts climbing. I have no clue. I mean, yeah. When you think about it, how do they get back up there? So we were just riveted and there were people kind of coming up and wondering what we're looking at. So what he does is he hugs the trunk and he kind of steps one foot up and, up and then he reaches up and hugs and he, he, uses, his, he uses his wings to walk up the trunk. It was just astonishing to watch him. The parents can't help him. They can't pick him up and bring him up there. But boy, are they watching. So here he is way up high. That little lump on the side of the tree is Waller. So he's climbed by himself vertically up, probably 40 feet. And, and you can't see it in this picture, but mom or dad is, is on the next tree over watching and probably whispering some kind of encouragement we can't hear. <laughs> um, but then they, they both come in to, to make sure he's okay. Yeah. And come over and, and check him out. Uh, they're great, the parents are great defenders of the baby. Here's mom or dad, and, and they're riveted on a crow who's kind of been harassing, walling off to the side, and finally, it's just too much, and they, they take off after the crow and chase the crow off. And so in this way, they launched their baby into the world. Now, Wallet grew up and started looking like any other barred owl, so I don't know where he is, maybe he's one of the owls in the forest now. Um, but he didn't, couldn't do it without help. Uh, some of you, uh, actually probably everybody in this room knew about the Eagle Baby last year. So we started calling him Ricky for little Ricky Ricardo. Probably a better choice to them. So you're familiar with the eagles that are flying along carrying their fish uh, with them for dinner. Uh, sometimes they get harassed too. And I'm thinking, you know, does this crow value his feet or what? But anyway, you've seen this stuff go on. And here are the two eagles in the nest from uh, last year. And uh, I don't know how well you can see, and I did put a little red circle around it. But here's, here's Ricky, that's the first portrait made of him. He's still fuzzy and he looks like a dinosaur, like birds are. So that was the first glimpse up of the nest, and if you know where the nest is, you know it's not easy to, to see in there. Um, as he grew, just like Wallet, he had to learn to stretch his wings, so he'd, he'd walk up and down on that branch, and kind of same thing, kind of flapping and turning and so forth, um, with these huge, huge, powerful wings. And uh, finally, um, this I think is his second flight ever. Unlike the baby owl who can kind of fly a little bit, he has to make a big flight for his first flight, so he flies to the next tree. And this I think was his second flight from that second tree on. And you can just see the excitement. And look, I did it! And he's over here, I think I can make it over there. And he does, and he doesn't land gracefully. You know, he kind of wobbles. But he makes it. And then he grew up, and it wasn't but a, another week or so that we couldn't see him anymore. Um, he, he'd take it off. Um, all the, of course, the story is full of forests that are little as well as big. And the next one is a middle-sized story. Um, this is a Cooper's hawk. Um, this is a, I'm pretty sure he's the male. And it's, it's a little hard to tell, but by his behavior. And you can tell he's an adult by the kind of orangish, orangish um, breast feathers. And here is his beautiful young girlfriend. And she is a, a young girlfriend. She's a, a second year bird in all her finery. So this was just uh, last week. Um, these photos are terrible, and I did the best I could to fix them up so you could see a little bit. And I'll try to explain them. So if you're a Cooper's hawk and you, and you have your eye on a young sweetheart, what you do is you bring her dinner. And so the guy on the left has brought in some prey. And she sees this, so she comes in, and she starts off down the branch, and she kind of, <laughs> kind of sidles over to kind of see, see what, he's, uh, what he's got. But he's not quite as good at the part of giving her the gift <laughs> as he started eating himself. <laughs> so, um, so she sidles over, and finally she lunges for it and grabs it and gangs it. But he's actually not finished with dinner yet. 
And so what she's doing here is pulling. She's pulling, pulling the prey. That's actually his leg trying to hang on. To the <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, she's yanking. He's like, oh, and then he kind of says, okay, honey, you get it. So here she goes, and she's flying off to the right with the prey, remnant, and he's going off to nourish his bruised ego or something. Um, so this is a, a baby uh, Cooper's talk from another year. And I, he just looked like a little angel to me. And, and there were, there were uh, three of them that year. Um, one of the things you have to do with your baby hawk is not only what the eagles and owls have to do, walking along the branch and learning how to fly, but, um, sorry, that's so exciting. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, if you're a cougar's hawk, you catch prey on the wing. So, you know, the eagle can kind of swoop down and catch a fish, um, and the owl sneaks down on a mouse. But if you're a cougar's hawk, you're after the birds in the forest um, as they fly. So what's a good thing to practice on if you're a baby hawk who hasn't done this yet? A pine cone. <laughs> so, oh, I thought that's what he was doing. So he's got a pine cone in here. He's going to kind of toss it up and catch it, and then he grabs it in the claw and flies off with us because we've got to practice somehow. Um, and, but you don't want to practice all by yourself. So you can hear the beautiful thing about you know, Cooper's hawks is you can hear them calling when they're growing up, so you can go find where they are. So this is, he's, he's calling out to a, a parent probably for help in feeding. Um, and here he's trying to practice landing, but he's obviously not chosen a very good place because the stick's only about like this big, so you grab onto it with one claw, but then you have to kind of flap off and, and actually this is a female. Um, it was, you'll see the bands on him. Uh, professional hawk bander was banding these young uh, that year, so we could keep track of them. Uh, so this is a young female who's got a little ways to go before she's, uh, she's good at landing in the forest. Um, here's a littler story. This is a, a Hutton's Vireo connected, collecting uh, nest material. I love this one. This is a bush tit. A bush tit nest about that big. It looks like a moldy sock. Yeah. Both, in contrast to what you may read, both parents build the nest, not just uh, one or the other. So this little guy, and it's a guy because of the dark eye, has brought in a, a little twig. You can see him to, to kind of go in there and weave it in the nest. Unfortunately, the twig was too big to fit in the entrance, and then it got tangled in the spider web, so it was kind of pulling and pulling and pulling to try to get it back out so you can get a better stick or a better angle or something. He worked that thing for, for quite a while trying to get it back off of the nest. Uh, this is a pine siskin uh, just from last week, and they're collecting nest material. Chestnut back to me. You don't, um, we'll talk a little bit more um, in a minute, and then on Saturday, if you want to come for a walk with me about how to find these things. But this is a, a tiny little hole you wouldn't notice, except the chickadees fly back and forth. So there's, there were two babies in this nest, and the chestnut back chickadees were just mom, dad, back and forth, back and forth, trying to get a dinner. Um, this is a golden crown kinglet. And these are two hummingbirds from the last year, on last year's fireweed. And what they do is they yank and pull the fireweed. He's trying to pull off the tuft for his nest, and then um, finally makes it. And um, so I'm just picturing the nest with these tiny baby, you know, baby or hummingbird eggs about that big in the nest, so soft with the firewood, fireweed um, uh, lining. So several stories. You could probably tell me stories. I hope you will on Saturday. But why does it matter? I mean, so we've got stories from the forest. They're, they're different kinds of creatures. Um, I think they matter in several ways. They matter for us as individual people. They matter for us. They matter for the creatures and the places about whom we tell them. And they matter for us as a community. And I'll just touch briefly on each one, and then I'll, I'll send you on to uh, Christopher Williams, who's been kind enough to come speak with us tonight. So thinking for a minute about why stories like this matter to us as individuals. You probably got told stories when you were a little kid, and you may be in the phase of now telling stories to grandchildren or, or children or, or others. If those children and grandchildren are lucky, they get told stories of the woods as well as words, words and woods. Um, it's a special kind of literacy that I think it's hard to live without. Stories like these are how we make meaning in our world through story, which we started this evening with story, like I said. Um, they're how we develop our understanding of what does it mean to be human. When you tell stories, you create that context for being human. And part of that context is a connection to being part of a broader community. But not only the human community, the community of the living earth, to which we are just intimately bound. And the stories help us understand um, that intimate uh, connection. Why stories matter to the creatures and the places is pretty simple. What we don't know, we can't protect. Until we know the stories, 
we can't know how to act to help those creatures. Um, just actually, just this afternoon, about two hours before I came, I had noticed a couple of days ago the little black hat chickies building a nest in an old phone pole. The next day, the people came to replace the phone pole. And went, oh my gosh. And so I called the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I called the Seattle Sea Line, and they said, oh, of course, we wouldn't. We we'll make sure that doesn't happen, and we'll save these little chickies. So I thought, hey, you know. That's <laughs> 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 the And then for us as a community, allow me, why? I want to just illustrate this briefly. So here's Lincoln Park, which we all know and love. Here's the owl that I showed you earlier, and that's about owl habitat. All these habitats I'll show you are bigger than I'm, I'm showing, but PowerPoint can only do so much. Um, there's the little vireo, which more the central part of the park. The uh, kinglet, often you'll see them along the edges. The cooper's hawk, more in the central forested part. That little black uh, chestnut black chickpea, all, a lot all over the forest, but here's two mine areas. The uh, hummingbirds, almost everywhere, and the eagles, even more everywhere. Now that's a pretty busy map, right? On purpose. The point is, it's a lot. Lincoln Park is a library of these stories. So it's not just birds; it's all kinds of critters um, who live in the park. Everything in the park is habitat filled with stories, filled with this library: birds, plants, insects, mammals, the atmosphere, weather. I'm a geologist, so I have to talk about think about the rocks. But it's a whole library, and learning these stories helps us help them. And so when we, as a community, understand the stories of the park, um, sorry, right in the way, uh, understand the stories of the park, we can help develop policy, we can help teach our children, we can help keep that park alive in the ways that are important to us and to it. If you want to find your own forest stories, there are three basic principles. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> If you put on track shoes and run through the Seattle Public Library, you're going to miss out on a lot. Okay? I mean, it, running in the forest is a wonderful. Like, but this, do, you know, if you want to go for your run, that's a fantastic place to do it. But at some point, you have to slow down if you want to read the stories and hear the stories. You have to quiet down. A lot of these stories are whispered. And so one of the ways you, you learn to find the stories is to listen to the whispers. The little, tiny little whispers of the the birds that tell you the hawk is landing nearby, and they're not real happy about it. And, and you can come up with your own illustrations. And then pay attention. Slow down, quiet down, pay attention with all of your senses, with your mind and your heart and your ears and your, and your nose and your eyes. They, and everything is a clue to some other amazing story. Lincoln Park needs you, citizen naturalists, to help sustain it naturally, to keep aware of these stories. For their sake, while well, it's safe, and Ricky's sake, <laughs> so I don't want to be in way. And all the babies and other creatures, baby pileated woodpeckers, uh, tiger swallowtail, western tiger swallowtail, baby cooper's hawk, morning cloak I saw just a couple minutes ago, seal pups on the beach, bees and flowers, and the whole rest of the kingdom. And then also for our sake, families, children, and all the rest of us, some of you may recognize Chris, ongoing found of wisdom in the forest. And so it's for all of our broader community. Won't you help? I just want to be there now, don't you? <laughs> Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. I'll be there. So we're honored to have Seattle Parks here tonight, too, and uh, interim superintendent uh, Christopher Williams. Um, very fortunate to have this partnership with the Pomeroy Community Association. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I grew up in West Seattle, graduate of Chief South High School. Uh, I remember uh, back at the age of 13, 14, I grew up uh, between uh, Webster and Othello on 34th. One thing I love to do was get on my bike and race down 35th, come around Fauntleroy, and hope the brakes would work. And spend all day in the park. So this is sort of the homecoming for me coming here. Can I ask the Seattle Park Recreation staff to come up for a minute because I want to introduce them to the wonderful jobs they do. So Dan, Cheryl, come on up, guys. So we are fortunate to have a dedicated group of park recreation professional staff. Ann Johnson here, who is our director of uh, park 
and Recreation Maintenance Services. Dan manages the budget, about 50% of the department. I'll talk about that later. He's responsible for all of the park grounds maintenance and all of the facilities maintenance. And then next to Dan, we have Cheryl Frazier. Cheryl is the uh, director of the, uh, let me get this right, the Regional Parks and Strategic Outreach Division. This is one of our solutions to the co problem we had last year. So, a mea culpa. And a we did learn some lessons, and I want to talk about some of those lessons. So, Cheryl is in a position as a division director, and she will serve as our policy lead on issues like the GOA proposals. Uh, we've been through lots of budget cuts. We've lost some of our uh, strategic capacity in the organization. And having a division director in the organization uh, work with Dan and myself and the other members of the executive team is really going to help us maintain that broader, big picture, strategic focus. Then we have Robert Stowers, who is your park resources manager for this end of town. Mary Oderette, also on the south end uh, staff. And Carl Baker, your crew chief. And Mark Bean, your senior urban forester. So thank you. So I came here with three goals tonight. Um, I have accomplished, I think, at least two. One in Mia Culpa for last year, uh, the second in the introduction of staff. And then a third to talk to you about our uh, park legacy plan. But before I get into that, I'm sorry, is that better? Okay. I, uh, I want to say thank you to the West Seattle neighborhood for your 3,000 volunteer hours last year. This department literally runs on volunteers, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to talk through uh, the Park Legacy Plan, and basically what this is, is this is our plan for the future. This is how we're going to uh, hopefully survive and build on the 130-year legacy of the Seattle Park and Recreation Department. This system was established in 1884 when the Guinea family gifted the first parcel of uh, park property to the city of Seattle. It was called Seattle's Park. It was way on the outskirts of downtown Seattle, which was then uh, the Yester Pioneer Square neighborhood, and they referred to it as uh, uh, Skid Road, where they skid the logs down on the skid down to the waterfront and hauled them off to, uh, I think, China, <laughs> or at least some other place. But um, uh, we have a wonderful park and recreation system. Uh, by 1903, the city council would hire the uh, architecture design firm of John C. Olmsted. And they would come to Seattle and lay out a system of parks, our system of boulevards, our greenways, uh, our park system. Uh, by 1934, the citizens of Seattle would pull together enough funding to build out 35 of those uh, original Olmsted parks to include Lincoln Park, Seward Park, uh, boy, Queen Anne Boulevard, Lake Washington Boulevard, lots of pearls on our system of, uh, system of uh, streets and boulevards that connect our park system together. Uh, by 1970s, the voters would approve uh, the forward thrust funding, or rather the forward thrust bonding measure that would build community centers, swimming pools across the system, uh, and really build out this park system to the wonderful system it is. By I'm sorry, by 1999, the voters would approve a, uh, a community center levy package, which would upgrade and renovate eight community centers across the system. By the year 2000, voters would tax themselves again to the tune of uh, $183 million to renovate and expand the park system. Since 2000, we have added some 262 acres of park land to the park system. The system, park systems want to grow. No matter where they are, they have this thing where they want to expand and grow. So uh, we heard a couple of speakers talk a little bit about the benefits that park provide. Uh, they provide a wealth of ecological services for critters in the park and for people. Uh, we know that our uh, park system provides environmental benefits. Uh, about 48% of the city's park land is covered with trees. Our parks provide economic benefits. Um, we've done some studies on what that looks like, and this plan talks about the economic benefits of parks, but also talks about the health benefits of our park system. Basically what I'm doing, uh, we have a 150-page strategic plan, and I'm attempting to walk through some of the highlights in that plan. 
we have some of the plan printed out for you here on the table back. Cheryl's holding it up. But we don't expect you to read the whole plan, but uh, you can go online and print it out. And um, you can uh, either pick up a copy on the back table there. So why are we calling it a legacy plan? What does the legacy and the word legacy plan mean? It really speaks to the fact that we have inherited this 130-year legacy of park system. It's one of the finest park and recreation systems, I think, in the world. I've had an opportunity to see many of them. And um, I think what we are attempting to do is leave this park system in a better place than we found it in. And we know that requires resources, that requires the ability to sort of build on the legacy, and that's why we're calling it the legacy plan. The legacy plan, in terms of what's in it, it's a data-driven plan that speaks to what it costs us to maintain an acre of parkland by park type, what it costs us to maintain uh, park and recreation facilities, uh, what the demand for services are. Uh, we went out and interviewed 4,000 people across the city and asked them what they thought about the Seattle Park and Recreation System. And uh, some of the things we learned is that uh, people uh, think that our highest priority ought to be not acquiring a new property, but should be in maintaining the property that we already have. And there's a slide later that I'll talk about. So I mentioned this being a data-rich plan and what that means for, for how we take a look at our future. Uh, basically, what this means is that the changing demographics in Seattle uh, are important to us to know and understand. It helps us raise several policy questions like who should we be serving? What is the demographic makeup? Uh, how is the demographic of Seattle changing? And what's the population going to look like 10, 15, 20 years in the future? Those are important policy level discussions that we need to have with you, the community, and internally to decide which services and programs we need to provide in the future that are going to be most relevant to the public that uses the park system. So one factoid here is that uh, people between the ages of 20 and 34 predominate the population in Seattle. Uh, we also know that um, in terms of how we rank nationally, 31% uh, of U.S. families have children living at home. Seattle, we are far below the national average. That leads to a policy question on, well, who should our programs be targeted at if 19% of the young people in the system, uh, rather, or rather in Seattle, uh, live with families? So that's not necessarily a question to lead us to believe that we shouldn't be serving young people, but it is the acknowledgement that um, uh, we should be thinking more deeply about our choices. I mentioned earlier that we asked the public through uh, surveys, intercept surveys, uh, statistically valid surveys, how they use the park and recreation system. We also asked them how they would use $100 of park and recreation funding. How would they allocate that? And what you see here is that uh, uh, almost 50% or rather greater than 50 percent of the people asked said they would allo allocate uh, every dollar of uh, funding for parks to either major maintenance or routine maintenance. Um, the acquisition of new parkland uh, ranked lower and new park development also ranked lower. So what that tells us through these surveys is that the public wants us to maintain what we have and they're not so much interested in the department acquiring a new property and uh, sort of building on our maintenance deficit. Okay, and what this slide shows is, um, again, this is a very data-rich plan. This slide shows uh, this big area here is our downtown parks. And um, you can see that we spend about $114,000 per acre maintaining an acre of downtown parkland compared to what we spend maintaining an acre of neighborhood parkland. When you look at big regional parks, like Lincoln Park, we get a great value there because we only spend about $10,000 per acre maintaining uh, big regional parks. There's a certain economy of scale that's lost in maintaining smaller spaces. Uh, the explanation for the downtown parks is because they are downtown's the economic engine for Seattle. Uh, that's where it gets the majority of use. It gets the tourism, and um, we want to keep that clean, safe, and appealing to the public. 
Okay, and what this slide is attempting to show is uh, over time, this red line represents our demand maintenance. This is all of the new properties we've acquired, all the new play areas, playgrounds, all of the new stuff that's represented by this line over a period of time, say since 1999 through 2013. That maintenance responsibility has been in an upward trajectory for years. Uh, the funded maintenance, however, has not kept up with the required demand. So we have this huge gap between uh, uh, the maintenance need and what we actually receive in funding here. And that's the problem this system has been trying to solve for years. So, um, okay, so what this slide shows, and uh, I apologize, it's not very, it's not a very uh, good slide in terms of your ability to read it, but what it attempts to show is uh, what the maintenance responsibilities are for Lincoln Park, for uh, Carol Baker and her crew, and how they spend their time. Uh, there are roughly uh, 104,000 planned hours for Lincoln Park. Uh, we track actual hours in terms of the work that staff actually do. Uh, that comes to about 52,230 annual hours for large urban parks across the system. We're probably at about a 50% service level for all of the large urban parks in the system. This other service level table here shows what we actually do, or rather, I'm sorry, what we plan for Lincoln Park. 12,000 hours of plan maintenance. We do maintenance management plans for all of our parks across the system. We don't just send trucks out there and hope that people uh, do a good job cleaning up. Uh, we actually have a plan that's laid out well in advance, and what we do is we track the actual hours against the planned hours, and that tells us that we're achieving about 40% of the actual planned hours of maintenance for Lincoln Park. That makes a good case for why we need more funding for Lincoln Park. Bear with me here, I'm catching up to myself. Okay, now what this slide attempts to show is uh, where the Seattle Park and Recreation budget goes. Uh, we are about a $130 million organization, and we have all of these divisions and all of these areas of responsibility in the department. I introduced Dan Johnson earlier. Uh, Dan manages a division that comprises 43% of the department's budget. Uh, the Parks Division is responsible, again, for um, park maintenance, uh, building and facility maintenance. On the other hand, the Recreation Division is responsible for all the operations of swimming pools and community centers. About 90% of this budget and the recreation area is directed at pools, facilities, and environmental learning centers. Uh, we also uh, technically own the zoo and the aquarium, and we provide funding there as well. And while this may look like a lot of funding, it actually is way short of the demand. So where are we going here? Uh, this is leading somewhere, and the somewhere <laughs> I think it's leading to is it makes a great argument for uh, what we need to preserve the system. Uh, the voters have approved levies uh, totaling nearly $500 million over the past 10, 15 years uh, to upgrade the park system. I liken the park system in Seattle to a Ferrari of a park system. And right now we have a Sears auto shop level of maintenance for our Ferrari. And we need uh, to uh, make some, uh, we need to make an argument for why this Ferrari of the system needs a Ferrari level of maintenance. So what we've done in working with the mayor and the council, uh, we've put together a citizen steering committee that will commence this summer. Uh, the mayor has appointed five members of the committee and the council's appointed the other five. And there's a appointee from the park board, the park foundation, and the associated recreation council, and we have a chair. This committee will do three, four things this summer. Uh, they will meet from roughly June through December 31st of this year. They will make recommendations to the mayor and the city council on the funding mechanism that will be proposed to voters in August of 2014. Uh, those funding choices include either uh, a metropolitan park district or uh, fixed levy for some term, 
Uh, they will also make a recommendation to the mayor on uh, the composition of funding. How much should go towards operations and maintenance? How much should go towards uh, capital and deferred major maintenance? We have about $250 million in deferred major maintenance in our system. So the legacy plan uh, that I just gave you the overview about, plus the citizen steering committee and public citizen engagement like this, we hope will lead to sustainable funding. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for volunteers to get involved. Uh, some key dates include a, uh, the first draft of the uh, park legacy plan was introduced to the public April 8th, a few weeks ago. Uh, from May 7th through May 22nd, we're having public meetings across the city. Your first opportunity for a public meeting will be at the Dakota Place, uh, let's see here, Dakota Place, uh, let's see, where are you? Yeah, there you are, on the 21st of May. Uh, we'll have a West Seattle meeting, and um, the public from West Seattle will be invited to attend this discussion to talk about your needs for, or rather, how you view the park system and how you interpret the need for more funding and how you interpret the park legacy. Okay, this again is how you get the plan. You can go to seattle.gov forward slash parks forward slash legacy and get the plan online. Uh, you can email us directly at parkslegacy at seattle.gov. You can see us on Facebook or Twitter if you do that. <laughs> we have just a couple minutes for questions. Um, I guess uh, for the superintendent or or any of the other speakers that have been out here tonight. So um, I want to try and honor our timeline this evening. But if there are any questions, you can feel free to come up. Yeah. Question is, what are what are things that walkers can do uh, if they don't have time to devote an afternoon? That maybe they could just pull something. Or, is that right, Ann? Stinky Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Go for Stinky Bob. Here's a flyer. Do I have that upside down? No, I got the right set up. That describes it, tells you how to pull it, lets you know what you what natives look like it, so you won't pull the wrong thing, and tells you how to handle it. So it's a lovely geranium. It has little pink flowers. Oh, yeah. It looks so nice, and it's so deadly because it, it kills other plants. So that's a really good one. Yeah. And then ivy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you come on the walk on Saturday, I'll point out plants that, uh, that you can pull when you're walking in the park and let you know how to handle them. Stinky Bob and Ivy. Stinky Bob. All right. Kids okay. love it because they love the name and they can recognize it. I wanted to thank everyone from the parks for showing up tonight. It means a lot to all of us. I, mm -hmm. I know that you're here, and so many of you too, um, for taking such good care of the park that we love. But I do want to ask you to follow up about the questions, to follow up on the lessons you did learn. You had mentioned that, so I wanted to, from the going that was over. Okay, so thank you for that question and for the opportunity elaborate on that. So we did we did learn some lessons. We did go back and ask ourselves from really a logic model standpoint, how did we get here, right? So we had a vendor come to us uh, last year uh, with this proposal they sort of drew on the back of a napkin and kind of gave it to the department and said, you know, we'd like to uh, install the zip line at Lincoln Park. And why don't you help us put it here? I think one of the lessons we've learned is that before we let someone come to us and say, why don't you put an idea here, um, we think that they ought to come to the community with some design standards, with some uh, a proposal that, that's comprehensive and more thought out. They should come not selecting a site before they've had a discussion about the engineering standards, the design standards, and the best practices for how you would operate something like that. So, you kind of need to back your way into those big changes 
by figuring because had you done the work, had, had the work been done on the design standards, engineering, some of the more technical components, we may have discovered very early that Lincoln Park wasn't a suitable location. So I think one of the lessons we've learned is we need to roll up our sleeves and um, not just say yes, but actually come back to the community. And one of the things I'm hoping happens here with uh, the creation of a new division within parks that Cheryl Frazier and Dan Johnson and our executive team, we basically bought ourselves more capacity to keep an eye on uh, these kinds of issues across the system. I think if that's in the budget of parts, that's a good thing. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? schedules, I know, Carolyn, you're going to talk about it. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and do that right now? As soon as I get it written. <laughs> um, so it, it should be on, I'm hoping to have it on tomorrow. Not tonight, not to get it done tonight, but by tomorrow night I'll have it on. Um, we're going to have Nature Walks um, on the uh, Fauntleroy.net, the FCA website, and we'll send it to Tracy and Patrick at the West Seattle Bar. Um, on Saturday, rain or shine, uh, we're going to have celebrate Lincoln Park, part two, 10.30 to 2.30. The low tide is approximately uh, 12.46. Um, Seattle Aquarium is going to have a staff person there and five volunteers. And then we'll have uh, tables with seal sitters and whale trails and um, Montmore Community Association. And then um, up on top in the forest by the little zip line and the playground, we're going to have tours, uh, four tours every hour at 11, 12, and 1. And the tours, one will be about birds and one will be about plants and one will be about photography and the other will be a creative uh, exercise. So it will be things like journaling and taking pictures and sketching and um, some of uh, the students at Seattle University and the environmental program are going to put together things like um, leaf hunt bingo and blindfolded meet a tree and mosaics on the beach. So there are things that uh, children would enjoy doing and um, introduce them to having fun in the park and learning about animals. Um, what else? I I think that's it, other than I want to thank um, all the um, organizations who came here tonight and provided information. I know at the zip line we heard so much uh, about the park and just tidbits of good things and interesting things about the animals and the experiences. So um, tonight is an answer to that so we could hear more and learn more. And um, hopefully all of you and, and uh, your friends and family can come on Saturday and enjoy the park itself. And also cookies. We've got cookies everywhere. So we have some cookies. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's uh, like a housekeeping thing. 
Right. But the little sign says celebrated part at Fauntleroy Hall. Right. And it says tonight and Saturday. But it should be a given that we would know we would go to the park on Saturday, right. but it doesn't say that. We're going to fix the sign. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know that we're going to be at the park on Saturday. <laughs> right. The wedding here doesn't know. <laughs> hey, we'll put up a sign. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, a lengthy sign discussion at our meeting, and um, our remedy is we're going to slap a, another piece of paper over the top of it and tell everybody to go to the park on Saturday. Thank you. So, uh, again, great speakers tonight. Yeah. Gary, did you have a hey, well, I just want to remind everybody we have two wonderful new banners. That being one of them, and another one pulling up. We're still uh, four eyes. I uh, will confirm here what's there. Look for those banners at the park. One will be down by the beach, as Carolyn suggested, and the other one would be up by that small zip line shelter up there. That's where it all starts, those two locations. Thanks, Gary. If you have any, that's it. Although Seattle Animal Control was not able to be here, and I know that all of you, if you're dog owners, certainly comply with Seattle Animal Control rules, uh, this is just a reminder that dogs in Lincoln Park must be on leashes. And I just found out today that leashes are to be no longer than eight feet. Okay, there, there's a little tidbit you might, might not have known. Um, and, uh, also, you must carry with you something to retrieve uh, doggy feces, and it's a, a finable offense if you don't, so it's a serious matter, and uh, it's an important thing for the ecosystem in the park that dog owners do remove those matters that dogs do in the park. It's part of the, one of the problems. So uh, I have some handouts from Seattle Animal Control. This has to do with licensing and what the fees are. And that's another requirement. You do need to license your dogs, but more importantly, you need to keep them on leashes in the park. So here's a handout about the Seattle Animal Control. <laughs> <laughs> Who's around to enforce these leash rules? Because people just, you know, uh, well, it is a bit annoying. It is. Well, um, Seattle Animal Control will respond, and they try to be there, but they're spread thin like all other departments. One of the things they explained was that if you give someone a violation, which occurs all the time, and if you perhaps, just by chance, not that you would follow anyone, I don't mean that, but if you by chance see someone get into a car with these animals that have been running loose, and if by chance <laughs> you should notice the license plate of that car, <laughs> they did give you a phone number to call. They would be happy to have you call with that information, and they will pursue it. So it helps to have the description of the dogs and the license plate number. So, oh my gosh, I knew this would generate. <laughs> Vicki, thank you. And again, uh, Animal Control, Don Jordan, 386-4286. And I would just invite if people have questions about that. Go ahead. Starts with us, right? As a community. Sorry, did you have a quick one? Yeah. I would like to add that it's not just about the dog on the leash, it's about the dog on the trail. Uh, we all know what an off leash dog area looks like. Lincoln Park has the most intact ecosystem of any park in the city. If we want this incredible natural treasure to look increasingly like a an off leash area, which is has no uh, no vegetation on the surface, uh, then we let we everyone can let their dogs run around off the trails. I got somebody his dog on a on leash this this evening saying, I don't care about the leash. I care about the dog on the trail uh, because of the incredible uh, natural treasures here. That so once again, it's all, all about us as a community that it's, it's to spread just, that word. It's, it's good, good advice. It's not just about the dogs fighting. Also, 
dump, um, keeping that keeping the dogs on the from, from looking like one of those awfully shares. Thank you. Yeah. So, and I know we can go on and on about this one, but that um, we've had such great topics tonight, and I really thank the speakers for for doing such a good job. We also had a phenomenal. Yeah. the Fauntleroy Community Association that put this on for you tonight. You have asked us to do this through your um, uh, surveys that you all kindly took, so thank you very much. Uh, you, you said do more um, community nights where you can come out and hear about things. So this is in answer to that. Um, Carolyn Duncan, a uh, big part of this. I'm going to pull out my notes for this. I'm not looking at a text from my kids. <laughs> uh, Bruce Butterfield. Uh, Judy Pickens, thank you very much. Treely Tucker, Gary Dawson, Phil, Phil Sweetland, uh, Vicki Schmitzbach, uh, Sharon Baker, Bruce Butterfield. I mean, did Bruce did I say it twice? Oh, Maybe. That's okay. <laughs> and Kim Petra. Um, thank you guys for putting this on. It was, it was very awesome. A couple of other thoughts real quick. Uh, we do have a donation box back there for the Fauntleroy Community Association. It would be a shame not to take advantage of this moment. <laughs> also, if you have not joined the Fauntleroy Community Association, I assume everybody has, but if you haven't, we've got sign-ups back there. Please please join tonight and um, eat cookies. <laughs> and, and thank you very much for being here tonight. I know that